this down. To pressures facing growers to adopt unsustainable farming methods, organic, biodynamics, permaculture, natural system organics, and the top 10 list. I'll we'll give that to you. I may actually go over by about three minutes, so just bear with me. Are you going to go on your list? Yeah, sure. 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 Pressure cooker. So I was made, told to do this. I'm the executive director for the Hallmark Growers Association. Um, that's, uh, by the way, Save the Farmer, Save the Land. Uh, you guys are actually standing on or sitting on uh, one of only three Class A, Class 1 lands in all of North America. And you paved over it. Congratulations. Yeah. Class 1, by the way, is where you can go everything. This is the world in the real. This is the Holland March. Yeah. Nature's second to none. We have everything. I've had to deal with wolves, endangered species. I've had to deal with, uh, in no particular order, a cougar, which the Minister of Natural Resources denied was a cougar, except for the fact that they had scat for it, which meant that there was a problem, because according to the Ministry of Natural Resources, cougars do not exist in Ontario. They haven't for the last 28 years. So the cougar that was on the property that I had to deal with was a myth. Yeah. Humans interact with it. We are to marsh. 12,000 acres of land. I can tell you right now that if we were to propose what we did 100 years ago, it would never be allowed by the government because of all the rules and regs that we'll have to deal with later on. Rod and I can talk about that. Okay. Freshness is growing. Rod and I will agree on this. We are the solution to all the healthcare problems that exist. Four of the top five diseases faced by North Americans are food related. In no particular order, you can do obesity, heart, cancers, all those are food related diseases that have impacted upon us. Yeah. Health spread from each field. The marsh grows 61 different crops. No, 62. No, 63 this year. I have more growing. When I started, there was 47 crops. These are not varieties. We grow 27 varieties of onions. We grow 34 varieties of carrots. We grow 22 different varieties of tomatoes. We grow 17 varieties of sprouts. They're not varieties, we grow crops. Next. So what pressures could create problems for this area known as the Hall Marsh? We're gonna talk about it. This, by the way, is the marsh. This is not a row crop. I'm gonna be the one that's, how should I say this, offensive to most of you, so just bear with me. Next. Top 10 reasons. And I was told to do a top 10 list, so we'll do the Paul Schaefer thing. Why you won't see farming the way that you want to see it. Number 10 is defining farming practices from the farmer's point of view. This is a nice little collage that we've done up. That's the city of Toronto in the background. The reason why you will not see farming from farming practices as you see it is because two things. First, define it for the farmer. Farmers are environmental stewards of the land. They do the very best thing because they actually play, work, and live on the land that they do. They have to. That is their occupation. That's their job. But in addition, that's their playground. They're always there. So they're not going to sit there and poison anything that they have to get money off of. And they're not going to do it because they all have families. So that's a difficult perspective to understand from a farmer thing. So that's the one thing that you need to know. By the way, Rod will agree with me on this, the finding agriculture. Define farming. I deal with 14 definitions of farming. We'll get to that. Next. Number nine, consumer expectations. God love you. In Ontario, we grow, raise, harvest, um, procure over 230 different crops and livestock. Notice the words I'm using. Our biggest issue in agriculture is definitions. We define it. Rod used a word that's really offensive to me. The word is commodity. Commodity is oil, gold, silver, that's a commodity. It grows food. There's a difference with what we do, and the whole point beyond it is that we have diversity coming out of the yin yang in Ontario. If I put you into the marsh, I can put you onto a spot in the marsh where everything that we do within this province, I can find within 100 miles. If that's your definition of local. Local to me is Ontario, because we are a big province. So therefore, that's where I'm going to get off. We have different things. Consumers expect different things. You expect different things because your definitions of what you eat are completely your own. 
If I was to tell you this, you'd laugh, but there are four definitions, four functional definitions of local government regulated. Federal government has one under CFIA, which is the Canadian Food and Inspection Agency, which is the former agency that we had to deal with. They define local as 35 miles. Anything within 35 miles is defined as local. Foodland Ontario is part of the government for the province of Ontario. Foodland Ontario well, has two definitions. One is all of Ontario. Obviously, they have to do it from Thunder Bay to Ottawa all the way down to Windsor and all points in between. Their second one is 100 kilometers, because somehow that got into the mix of what we need to deal with. The 100 kilometers, by the way, did not work out well for Hamilton. Hamilton got its butt kicked because 100 kilometers put a farmer out of Peterborough, but put three farmers in from Ohio. That's 100 kilometers. So consumer expectations, I just said three of the definitions. The only consumer expectation, the only definition that I care about is the consumers. They define what they want for local, whether it be within 100 miles, whether it be in their backyard, whether it be the province, whether it be the country, whether it be just North America. That is the only definition that should really matter. You shouldn't regulate nor govern what the definition of local is because that puts impediments in front of the farmers. So that's a pressure. Next. Number eight, farmers themselves. These are my guys. Don't let anybody tell you different. Farmers, the average age is 58. We are the oldest sector in all of Canada. Oldest. You guys are all pups. These guys do it because they like doing it. This is both a living and a lifestyle choice. They don't like dealing with people. They are 1.3 to 1.4% of the population in Canada. 70 years ago, they were a whole whopping 38%. 100 years ago, it was 60%. 100 years ago. No. Yeah, that's right. 20, 1912, right? 2012? Okay, good. So we were more than 60%. The farmers themselves are their own biggest challenge. Because once you hit a certain age, these guys I deal with all the time. This is the force. That's dad. That's junior. That's really junior. Junior wanted to take over. Junior is also a race car driver because he needs a second income. This does make enough money on the farm to be able to do it. Dad, in an answer to Rod's thing, hasn't yet figured out how to give the farm over to his son because there are tax implications for a million dollar operation that he can't deal with. Grandpa got caught in the tax implications that cost him $373,000 and his house simply because he tried to make the farm to him. Dougie here, Doug got the farm because his father died. I liked Adrian, but poof, thank God he died because that left him with an issue he didn't have to deal with. That's sad when you have to talk about that because his son is 14 and really wants the farm and he does everything. And the 14 year old is gonna have problems simply because of the barrier in front of him, which is a taxation issue. So the farmers themselves are also problematic. Being 58, they're set in their ways. The older guys that I've dealt with, this is their life. The line is this. My grandfather did it on 40 acres. My father did it on 40 acres. I should be able to make a living on 40 acres. Some 91% of these farmers have second off-farm incomes, whether it be their wife, who's usually a teacher, nurse, or something, or they themselves have second off-farm incomes. Your food is being built on that system because these guys don't consider it a hobby. They consider it a lobby, but they just can't make money off it. Next. Markets and marketing. This is why I like your group. Trontonians, and I'm just using this as a generalization, so Lauren, don't kick my butt. This is what they think is farming. They look at that and they think, oh, that's wonderful. Look at that. This is taking place. They see the cattle amongst all the dead cars out there, and they think this is cool. And that's their idea of farming. And they see the asparagus and the apples at the farmer's markets, and they think that's it. I like what Rod said, because he was very polite. I'm not. The food system is broken. It's inevitably corrupt, and it's problematic, because everybody has their own vision of what's there. Food is an essential component to life. 
I don't care where you come from. I don't care how you cut it. Food, water, air, and shelter, particularly here in Canada. And my line is the line of three. Three minutes without air, generally, you die. Three days without water, generally, you die. Three weeks without food, you're dead. Three months in this country without shelter, you're pooped. These are the threes that we have to work with. But that's the reason why we can't do this, is because everybody has a different view of what farming is. If you were all to come up to the marsh, and by the way, you're all welcome to come up as a group and I'll tour you around. This is not what you see, because this is a different image of farming. There are small farms all the way through the province. And to Lauren's comment, yes, I did do this. For 7,000 farmers I visit across Ontario and Canada and the U.S., I know these guys. I can take you to 7,000 different operations, because every farmer, and this is where the markets and marketing come in, every farmer is an independent entrepreneurial business person. It doesn't matter how you cut it. You can't lump them together. You can't group them together because they all do their own thing. They are all different. So try dealing with, in my case, 9,000 farms here in Ontario. They are all different. That's why the markets are suspect. We are globalized. We are in a monopoly situation with our retails. I'd love to be in California where they have actually 17 retailers that you can go after, but we have three. So when you want good food, when you want Ontario growing food, we have problems because that system, which is broken, is now about geared at the lowest price, regardless of where it comes from. Next. Location, location, location. This is a pretty picture. Like that. Pretty cool. There's your monopoly on farms. Just so you know, farmers are the largest landowners in all of Ontario next to the provincial government. Farmers are. That 1.3 to 1.6 of the population own more land than anybody else in all of Ontario combined except for the government. That is about maybe six or seven hundred farms that you can see from the escarpment. And this, let me see if I can find it, this stretch along here no longer exists. That's industrial buildings. That's a new subdivision. That's commercial and retail operations. That's just outside of Milton is what the largest city going. So that's what you have to focus on. If you don't have the land, you don't have the food. If you don't have the food, guess what? You're reliant on other countries that you couldn't probably identify on a map to hope that they're going to feed you. Next. Keeping up with the Joneses, this is one of my favorite things because this is reality for me. Everybody looks at that and says, oh, that's, that's really sweet, you know, 40-year-old tractor. This tractor is still worth about forty, fifty thousand dollars. That combine up there for hay, that's only worth about four hundred thousand dollars. This setup, you'd like this. Who has GPS? Who drives first? I should, no, I should make an assumption you drive. Anybody drive? Nobody <laughs> drives. That's cool. You all ride bikes, so you don't have a GPS system on your bike. For those of us that actually know the province, I don't bother with GPS, I can laugh, but for somebody like Warren who gets lost just leaving the city, <laughs> she needs a GPS. GPS was around for 10 years before it got to you guys. We used it. GPS was used as a technology to help farm, to help do stuff. This is a GPS control tractor. You'll notice there ain't a driver in there. He's good for 11 minutes outside of the tractor without. That's a $600,000 unit all combined because these guys are planting early transplants, by the way these are onions, and there's Jason, he's wandering out, he's going to do that for 11 minutes, and on the 12th minute, the GPS system is going to go, are you there, are you still alive, and it's going to veer off and do this, and quite funny, you can actually see the roads where they've actually been out of the tractor because you have straight lines, and then it goes like this, and then it goes back over, but it asks whether you're still alive and whether it needs to call 911. So, from this, which is a 40-year-old, it's, it, it, it's beat up, but they still use this, to this on the same crop. That's the technology that has changed. Keeping up with the Joneses means you literally have to be able to keep up with the technologies that are there. One final note on this, everybody's going food safety certification within the marsh. That's all computer technology. Please tell me what 50-year-old, let's go even better, what 58-year-old, like stealing with computers. 
They don't. I still have guys using Atari. That's the funny thing. And it's true. There's a guy that has an Atari system and that's what he uses on his computer. He doesn't understand Word, he doesn't understand Microsoft, he doesn't understand Windows, doesn't like the internet. All this stuff is geared towards having farmers your age be able to do this stuff because you grew up with the technology. They did not. So, predicting what to know anything different. You've never known anything different. You've had availability to food unheard of in any generation at any time, anywhere. You have Kiwis, and by the way, when you do this with grade fours, you say, where's Kiwi? And they say, well, it's from British Columbia, or they say it's from Africa. And I like doing this one, because Kiwis are from New Zealand, and that's where we get it. But most people don't know. We had to adapt up here. So we have an Ontario variety of Kiwi, and it's growing up in Barrie. A buddy of mine grows it up. But we've had to adapt to your needs. We can't predict. The Marsh guys are growing more Asian crops because the demographic here in the city is changing. The demographic down in the U.S. is changing as well. So we've had to adapt to different cultures and make sure that they understand that when they come over here, cultures do like comfort foods. There are certain comfort foods that they enjoy, bok choy for one. That's very much a comfort food. But if you don't grow it, they have to import it. And if you have to import it, then you're not sure what the hell you're doing with it anyways. Next. Number three, Mother Nature, the environment. I am not one that goes around saying chicken littles thing. I'm not a global warmist, I'm not anything. I'm a guy that says, you know what? We do have issues. Mother Nature has a, 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 a lot of fun dealing with us. We've had tornadoes in the marsh even though we shouldn't. We have our own microclimate in the marsh because of the black soil. That's true, those are things that we deal with. That was, by the way, a thunderstorm that came ripping through and dashed the boat, I think, four inches of rain in the space of an hour on it. Uh, last week, when was it? Wednesday or Thursday? When we just got the living snot kicked out of us, 75 millimeters of rain in four hours. Uh, my guys were joking that they shouldn't have planted, they should put rice in. Because the marsh is that wet and it always absorbs. Mother Nature is going to come back and get you guys. Not me, because I'm going to be old and I'm done and it doesn't matter. It's going to come back and get you. She's going to sigh and go, enough. And we're already seeing this. We're seeing drought conditions in places we've never seen before. We're seeing horrendous droughts in California and Texas where they have no access to water. By the way, that's where all your fresh produce comes from, from the Georgia. California just had to cut a $217 million deal with farmers last month for water irrigation because they have no irrigation because the Sierra is dry. You have countries around the world that you can't identify where water is a severe issue. We have access to water, but we also have severe weather conditions. I'm not a global warmer. I'm not an environmental adjunct anything. I'm not somebody that's apocalyptic. I just know that this is stuff that's changing out here. And farmers have to adapt to Mother Nature. I would defy anybody in their right mind if they knew there was a one in four chance that every time you stepped out of the job, or step out of your house to go to your job, a one in four chance that everything you've done has been obliterated, you wouldn't do it. That's insanity. Ask the apple guys. 80% of Ontario's apple crop, by the way, gone. It was because of Mother Nature. Because March rolled the dice and says, hey, let's get rid of winter, and we'll come in with 22 degree weather. And by the way, we'll let the trees all bud, and then we're going to freeze it for a little bit. And then we're going to let it warm up. And then we're going to freeze it again. And finally, one more time, we'll let it warm up and freeze. 80% of the apple buds are gone. Tender fruit is, I'd say, 65%. Uh, the grapes, the vines have huge issues. These are conditions we deal with year in and year out. Rules and regs. This is where Rod and I always have fun. I represent the Holland Marsh. It is the most heavily regulated piece of land in all of Ontario. Actually, I probably beggar to say it's the most heavily regulated in Canada. In no particular order, I deal with this. Five municipalities, one region, one county, two conservation authorities, 20 provincial ministries, 14 federal ministries, 27, soon to be 28 major pieces of legislation, 119 rules and regulations. Would you like my job? When I was emailing people, that was because I was dealing with the MOE. 
thorn in my side because we have a government that's contradictory in what they do. But I deal with it because you can find ways to deal with this stuff. You have to position it up front. But everything that we've geared this towards makes it that much more difficult for what we do up there, which is grow food for you. This, by the way, is part of my issue. Water is a huge issue. We have access to water everywhere. We can no longer afford not to look at water. But I will tell you this, we get grief because it's like Simcoe. We get grief now, the next major piece of legislation, in case you're not aware, is the Great Lakes Protection Plan, which the Ontario government is going to put in. God love them. But that's going to cause me more grief. Water is not an issue where we farm. We have canals. And everybody comes up and says, oh, aren't you going to drain the canals? I can no more drain the canals than I could drain Lake Simcoe. And all the water drops down, feeds the crops, goes up top, rains, comes back down, and we all have water. That's how the system works. We work within a natural system to start with. Our rules and regs are not about killing off property or land or anything else. We're about this. I will say one thing, Rod, and I differ on, and it's fine with me. All right, can I do a pop quiz? I like this one. Pop quiz. How many in the room are firm believers that organics mean no spray? So please, just be honest. Hands up if you believe so. Nobody? You're all educated? This is great. You hesitated. <laughs> how many can tell me, because I interact here, how many can tell me how many regulatory systems are out there for organics around the world? Anybody? No? You don't want to? Rob? How many around the world? 27 regulatory organic systems around the world. You would honestly think that we could kind of devise a way that we can look at it and say this. Because the one thing there was organic, the final. 100 years ago, it was organic. Everything that you did was organic. It didn't matter. So here's how offensive it gets. There's five regulatory systems in California. One federal, one state, three dependent on a growing area. They define themselves in whatever context is there. Rod was part of this. How many years did it take us to get an organic system here in Canada? Seven. Well, yeah, but you, you want to deal with that one. I laughed between the other stuff. Mulroney well, didn't even know what it was. Seven straight solid years where federal bureaucrats were working on it. Want to know what the one thing that impeded them on? Language. Biologique in Quebec, because we're bilingual. Biologique means biological here in Ontario. Organic means organic. We had problems with defining what it was. By the way, just so that you know, for all those that were really shy not to put their hands up, Organics doesn't mean no sprays. Organics means no synthetic sprays. You spray all kinds of stuff. Now before this, <laughs> before you see this, this is, by the way, water, so I'm not doing anything there. The favorite top three organic sprays in the United States are, anybody? Copper sulfite. It kills all the amphibians and the fish inside the water, because you're not allowed to have that on any organic systems. Number two is arsenic. By the way, both of those are heavy metals, just in case you missed it. And rank number 13 and 17 in Toronto water tests. Number three is nicotine. Nicotine's an organic spray. That's why you always want to smoke after a salad. <laughs> this is what you deal with. This is real life. So when you come back to me and ask questions as to why we can't do it, it's because yours, and here's my number one, is you. You're my biggest problem. Because <laughs> y'all have a little bit of knowledge, but you don't have a vast bit of knowledge. Y'all come in with your own concepts and pre-concepts and preconceived concepts that you've read on the internet. God love you for that. You can be my greatest champions and also be my greatest pains in the ass. That's the problem. You take a little bit of knowledge and you move it forward, that's fantastic. You guys are here to learn, hopefully you do. But at the end of the day, it's people that want to make a difference. What is that old line? The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. If you're all the best of intentions, I'm dealing with the best of intentions with the Ontario government right now. I'm in hell. I play in hell every day. Just so you know, I do play with all these ministries. I don't just play with OMAFRA. I play with all these ministries. Because hell has a big bound that knows no limit the kind of grief that can go on to a farmer who at some point is just going to say enough.
And that's what's happening out there is all the farmers that grow your food, they're all leaving because they've had enough. Be the champions that you can be by learning everything that you can do. That's all I'm asking from your group because you guys are the educated and you guys can bring it forward. That's it.